Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out to uh, GDC and Exola Dev Sessions. Um, we're going to talk, uh, talk about uh, how to build powerful web shop experiences and the latest rulings uh, that's been going on with Apple and Google versus Epic. Um, we've got a great panel today. Um, Jenna, why don't you do a quick intro? Sure. Um, I'm Jenna. I am currently overseeing business development, publishing partnerships for a company called Skydance. Uh, they are most well known for being a Hollywood traditional production company. They made little titles called Top Gun and Mission Impossible. They make a series called Reacher and all the Jack Ryan stuff. Um, but I oversee the virtual reality studio. Um, and pleasure to be here. Yeah. I'm Michael Lewis. Everyone calls me Lewis because there's always a lot of Michaels, <laughs> as you can see. Um, you know, I work at Take Two Interactive. Uh, Take Two is the publisher that owns um, Rockstar, uh, Zynga, 2K, and Private Division, and uh, Ghost Story. Um, and you know, the area of responsibility for me, I work on direct to consumer and on building a lot of the core central technology for uh, for our labels to to support them um, and to help them, you know connect directly with customers and sell D2C. Um, you know, I've been here for about five years. Prior to that, I was at EA for about a decade building out Origin, which is EA's D2C platform. So I've been working on direct-to-consumer for, uh, for a little while. Um, and you know, just as a caveat, the, you know, all my views here, this is my own views. They're not the <laughs> views of Take-Two. They're not the views of Zynga, of Rockstar, of 2K, private vision of any of our labels. So you know, this is my own, uh, my own thoughts and opinions. Cool. Uh, my name is Spencer Tucker. I am currently the CGO at Yuga Labs. Uh, historically, I've been at a bunch of different free-to-play companies, mobile, PC, MMOs as well. Uh, I am overseeing pretty much everything soup to nuts from a gaming standpoint, which includes direct-to-consumer, uh, as well as kind of like some of the PC, crypto, NFT strategies, um, and kind of acquisition strategies, et cetera. My name is Michael Spieler. I'm uh, VP of Corporate Strategy and Development at SciPlay. Uh, I work on all kind of corporate initiatives, strategic initiatives, including uh, D2C, M&A. Um, I also come from the actual being on the game team's background, so I assist with product and all that kind of stuff whenever there's a need. Awesome. So I'm Sam Gaglani. I'm the EVP of Global Business Development at Exola. Been at the company 13 years. Um, all four of these people here are just tremendous people in the industry. Um, I consider them friends and uh, associates in a way. Um, so and we kind occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> when he remembers your name. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jenna. Um, so a lot has been going on in the last six months uh, with uh, Apple and Google and the Epic uh, uh, rulings and what's been going on um, with DMA. So I think. I kind of wanted to start this talk about what the what the, the biggest updates are, get your kind of point of view on how you you know think think things are going. Um, what I've seen and what I think is going to continue to happen is that Apple and Google are not going to give up their stranglehold on uh, the, that twenty seven percent. That's where they're at right now. Um, They've even instituted uh, you know install fees if you're in Europe uh, for side loading. Uh, they've got some wacky calculator now that I tried to try to figure out myself. I'm not a math guy. I'm sure one of you guys tried to play around with it. It's pretty interesting. Um, but the bottom line, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, is that uh, that 27% is not going to go away until there's more uh, legal action or a bigger uh, court uh, comes to say you have to cave in. But there's just too much money on the table right now. Um, so I'd love to hear your opinions. I know there's, and these are your opinions of uh, where you see it happening or going. That's for the group. Cool. I mean, I can I can start. Yes, you can yeah. get the ball rolling. All right. Um, yeah, I, I think you know my point of view is at the end of the day, this is a margin game. Yeah. You're 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 dealing with uh, time, kind of two competing interests: uh, the interest of um, publishers to manage their margin profiles effectively mm -hmm. and, and kind of on the on go I like operating in confident and kind of keep it up. Um, and you're dealing with a, a you know the platform business who makes a significant amount of money yeah. off that maintaining you know 27, 30 yeah. percent of what have you. So I think ultimately you know both parties are going to try to optimize over trying to, to kind of achieve the best uh, sort of middle ground possible. And I agree that you know I don't see 
a, a relaxing of the, the 30% or 27% until there's a significant degree of pressure, or an alternative uh, way to, to generate revenue that replaces the lost revenue from, from kind of uh, you know, losing it uh, as a result of direct. Yeah, I agree with you. The thing that uh, you know, I keep hearing them, you know, Apple and uh, Google say as well, you know, you're getting something for this 27% or 30%. Um, in my opinion, they're just a very expensive, they've become a very expensive payment processor. Um, do you think there's anything that they're offering now, like discoverability or feature sets, or like, do you think it drives revenue, or is it just now a, a payment processor that you're dealing with? I know that's a loaded question, so, <laughs> and some people may not want to answer it, but my opinion. I mean, I would say they do provide something. They're a distribution platform along mm -hmm. with the payment provider. Um, it's one of the reasons they're able to charge what they charge is yeah. because the way that people find and download the apps is through the App Store. And now with the DMA and, and some of the app, Epic versus Apple, like you, you have some of the side loading stuff, but people are used to what they're used to and that's what they're comfortable with. Yeah. So it's gonna be time for those to become legitimate distribution channels. Yeah. I think you're paying that margin, the 27%, is for their audience. Because you're still, in the end, always negotiating for that placement, for that yeah. marketing. If, that, if mm -hmm. it came with all of that in, in, a, in a guaranteed kind of way, yeah. then I would say it's a little more justifiable. Yeah. But I'm always still fighting for those things that you would think come with that service, yeah. if you will. I get it. Um, sometimes it depends who picks up the phone. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's debatable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's also, there are kind of two things that are going on in parallel, and it's tempting to bundle them together, but I actually think it's a little different. Like, the DMA and the Apple and Google lawsuits are kind of different. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, Europeans will decide what's right for them mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, what percentage of that, you know, whatever it is, $100, let's just say, goes to, is, you know, return to the player, what percentage goes to Apple, what percentage goes to the publisher. Um, I don't know that that's, I think that's something that, you know, Europeans will, will decide. Um, I would just say, like, I think in the long arc of history, this isn't something that's gonna be resolved in the next, you know, six weeks. It's not something that's yeah. gonna be resolved in the next 10 years. I think it's somewhere in between those yeah, things. But I, agree with you. I don't think the 70-30 margin structure is gonna be around in, you know, in 10 years, but I don't think it's gonna be gone in three weeks either. And I'm not sure what that time between is. It's yeah. gonna take court and legislation and a yep. lot of public pushback. Um, right. You guys agree? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think what it all points to and what we've been seeing with partners like such as yourselves and other partners is that it really is important to build a powerful web store experience. And then the trick is getting those users to those stores and retaining them. Um, Spencer, I know at your previous companies, you did just that. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear like, kind of like, you know, the genesis of the idea. And I know you have a long history of doing direct to consumer. So maybe a little background and uh, how, how it all started. Yeah, sure. So um, my direct to consumer experience actually probably goes back almost two decades. Yeah. Uh, back when I, I was working at a, uh, a company that was doing free-to-play games, um, really early in the free-to-play sort of era, like very, very early on, uh, publishing games out of um, APAC, like uh, South Korea, China, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, et cetera. Um, and those games all had their unique clients and with integrated web stores, but we found that those web stores were difficult to manage because they were being developed by um, you know, third-party developers overseas, weren't super flexible, weren't optimizable in the way that we wanted them to be. We couldn't, we couldn't do segmentation. We couldn't do uh, you know, really sophisticated sort of uh, optimization processes to, to kind of like generate um, uh, like more engaged uh, spend behavior or more engaged player behavior. And so what we ended up creating is a, a kind of centralized web, web store. Hmm. Um, it was effectively probably one of the first sort of just pure web stores. Um, and we effectively pushed people from the clients, from the game clients, out of the game client, and then onto, uh, onto web. Um, and when I first sort of 
had the experience of like pushing the, the players out of the, the game experience and onto this other platform, I didn't think it would be super effective because I thought there was a lot of friction involved in that process. But the reality is uh, players will go where players see value. Mm -hmm. um, and if you create a sticking, engaging experience around not just a store, but around the ecosystem of that store, uh, the social experience, how those things are all connected, the interoperation between games and kind of connecting communities together, I think that's where the, the real uh, power is. And so the, the company that I was working at literally did like 95% of their, uh, their revenue off of uh, off these web stores. Wow. Um, wow. And, you know, that, that was my experience there. We built all kinds of tools that would, were then like commoditized and shared between products because we owned uh, the interface. So it, was, so it wasn't on a buy game basis. We actually, oddly enough, would pull systems we saw work well in the game as a retention mechanic or as a mechanic to motivate certain player behaviors. And we would make those, uh, those applications kind of like for spend behaviors instead. Mm -hmm. So instead of like grinding a mob, you know, we created like things like Loot Forge, Loot Will, like all these things that, that are enchanting systems, that kind of stuff, like rip them out of the game, basically make them into like a, a kind of like purchase mechanism and then apply those to this, this centralized storefront um, and tied all the forums and social uh, kind of components to it and had like chat and all kinds of crazy stuff, but it was really successful. So, um, you know, so this was like time, a precursor. Yeah, this was the precursor, yeah. precursor. So, so I knew that this stuff worked and I knew that like people will adopt something that they find valuable. Um, and if it's sticky, they'll stick around with it. And it actually becomes like a primary place uh, to not just transact, but also interact with other yes. people. Yeah. Um, and so when I moved out of the, the PC scene into, uh, and, and web scene into the uh, mobile gaming scene, um, you know, it, it, it felt to me like this was definitely an opportunity um, because not only does it Again, you know, optimize your margin. It's like one of the costs that scales with revenue is platform fees. Yep. And obviously, um, if you've got an opportunity to uh, optimize that, that's a, a big opportunity right? that can change your P&L pretty materially. And then you can reinvest that money on, on performance UA and scaling. And you yep. can bake in some uh, assumed sort of conversion rate into those, into those processes. So your LTV might be the same, but your net LTV is yeah, much higher, it's higher over time. Uh, and so it gives you a distribution in, sort of advantage as well. So uh, looking at that stuff, and it was like, yeah, again, you know, people were like, oh, you know. So the, yeah, so I want to touch on that. So you were at a pretty large org. Um, yeah. And this was before the lawsuit had even started. Oh, yeah. And that's when you approached me. Yeah. And you kind of said, I have this hypothesis, Yeah. yeah <laughs> this yeah. idea. And that back then, the guidelines were pretty strict. You had to have a WebGL version. You had to have SKUs yeah. you know, across all of it. And you had through. kind of checked all the boxes. Yep. How did you sell, and this is for some people that are at large orgs, how did you sell that internally? Or was it a big fight? Or it, did you just kind of go under the radar? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, it was a challenge. I think everyone sees the value of it, yeah. right? And that's, that's enticing. But I think there's a lot of concern and fear mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes justifiably yep. uh, to, to kind of like chase, especially to do something before anyone else has done it. Like yeah. that's always, that's always hard. Um, but uh, I think the thing that made it work was kind of two things. Like one, um, doing it in a smart way uh, that was like risk mitigated. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is you know, building, again, in my opinion, is like it works best when you deliver something that really changes the player um, sort of experience. And so the, the idea was not just, hey, let's pop up a web store and, uh, and kind of move transactions over here and offer a discount or something like that. It was, how do I create an ecosystem that's sticky? And what is the, what is the actual plan to make that experience, like essentially another touch point for the players outside of the game itself. So an experience, it's a, it becomes a portal or a destination. It, it does, and, yeah. and, and, and I mean, there's a lot of things you can do there you just can't do in an app, yeah. right? And, and think about this. I mean, this was another thing I, I'd bring up all the time. Um, you know, if you're gonna develop features in a game, uh, especially if that game is on, you know, like a, a platform like Apple or Google, um, features take a long time, and you're dealing with a code base that could be 
you know, evolving over the course of years. And so yeah. it's every that feature is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, every, every feature is really expensive. Yeah. And every feature can break something. Yeah. You know, and it takes a long time to get anything out. And then there's a lot of fear because you're going to apply it to an entire audience and the front of the funnel, right? Mm -hmm. So like all new players coming in are going to interact with it. All existing players are going to be impacted by it. Um, and so it's a, it's a costly, long process. What you can do with like a web portal like that isn't just like, you know, offer direct co to consumer products. It is also, you can make it a test bed for like new features that you want to mm, adopt to the game. So that's what we would yeah. do. Yeah. You know, we'd build like, like I built um, uh, like a retention feature that is basically a, uh, uh, a kind of like what I called like fear of loss um, sort of uh, engagement feature. It's a, effectively every time you perform this action over the course of a series of days, as long as you don't miss a single day, you build up the rewards, and those rewards are contingent on that behavior being persistent Repeated over time. Over a period right? of time. And so wow. you see how effective that is on the audience you have driven into the, into the web. Um, and if it looks like it's moved the needle in terms of retention or LTV, then you can put that on your roadmap and invest the actual time to, to kind of build it natively in the app. And so it becomes like not just an opportunity to you know, generate um, like margin upside, et cetera. It also becomes an opportunity to test um, you know, new features and things like that without risking breaking something yeah, in the app that generates most of your revenue. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So Lewis, I know you've been playing around with it and sure. at Take Two, so does a lot of that kind of... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that's exciting about that is you know, Take Two has a really broad portfolio of games as well. And one of the things that I think is most fun about a web store is that you can start to actually create offers that don't exist in game mm -hmm. and capabilities that don't exist in game. So, I mean, I just think that's awesome. Like, we could actually make something that the game team doesn't have to do. You could set up brand new mechanics that, that yeah. don't exist without them really having to lift a finger is, is one of the things I, I thought is the you know, most interesting about this space. So when, when you started at Take Two, was this a mandate to create these web shops, or was it the lawsuit that really kind of like said, okay, guys, we need to take a serious look at this? And that, did that come from top down, or did you push that from up, so take, up to the top? Take Two's had a direct to consumer mm -hmm. service for, you know, for a while. Yeah. You know, we used to basically build you know, launchers and put um, products, you know, sell products directly to consumer yeah. um, across each of our labels. But when I joined, we really doubled down on that. Um, in terms of doing this on mobile, you know, Take Two had you know half a dozen mobile games that were that were live, and we started to kind of test the waters and uh, build out web stores for that. I'd say, you know, post the lawsuit, and then you know, uh, Take Two bought Zynga, and then that um, you know, kind of intensified the yeah. focus on on web stores since there's you know two billion dollar um, mobile game publisher uh, joining. <laughs> um, but I'd say like it wasn't really. Each of the labels, you know, has different desires with respect to direct to consumer. Take Two isn't like a top-down kind of company. It's much okay. more game teams can decide, you know, what's right for them and what central services they yeah. want to adopt. Yeah. Um, so it was much more of like a pull function than a thou shalt, you know, do this. Got it. Yeah. Um, if that if that makes sense. Got it. And those dynamics, I think, are different from from company to company. Okay. And Michael, you're at a social casino company, was this kind of the strategy going forward, or had you guys been playing around with this for a while? So it's definitely something we've always been thinking about. Yeah. You know, our company mission is to be a player first focused yeah. company. So uh, like Spencer said, with all the segmentation and everything, we try to customize the user journey and what they see and what they do to what they want to see and what they do. Um, so that includes also creating this web experience that includes DTC. Um, if that's something that they're interested in, and helping continue their experience outside of yeah. the the core game. So I think the, the big takeaway I've, I've gotten is you've got to provide value when you yeah. get that player yeah. to the store. I should also just say, like Zynga had a direct to consumer business since you know basically the since it started migrating off Facebook. Yeah. So, you know, they had web stores for, yeah, you guys you know, had for deep poker, for Hit It Rich, yeah. for, yeah. you know, a bunch of games in production for the better part of a decade. Yeah. So it wasn't really an anathema to start to broaden the scope of those web stores and to make that, you know, available for users who played on mobile yeah. as well. And they they had, I'd say like one of the challenges is if you don't have a lot of those central systems, like 
identity systems, entitlement systems, you know, the ability to cloud saves, like then it, it becomes a lot harder to go yeah. from a cold start. But for teams that have a lot of those capabilities, you know, adding a web store isn't a massive lift. Yeah. You know, it takes us four to six weeks to add a web store for, wow. you know, for a new game at this point. Um, we're laughing because when you were at Niantic, we were, you know, you can yeah. talk about it, I guess. Yeah, prior to joining Skydance, I was at Niantic, um, where we made Pokemon Go, and... Four to six weeks for the website. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's depressing. Um, <laughs> to your point before, it, it does vary per company, yes. and you would think, you know, we have... Wait, when I was there, Pokemon Go, it was the first time we ventured into yeah. a web store, so it was really hard. So all the variables in the equation that you have to consider are just, it's the first time they're considering this. So, you know, you can look at it from just, oh, we're gonna, you know, circumvent the store, we're gonna make some money. Okay, no, let's think about adding value. What right. is that player experience? Okay. Then you have to think about the resources. Who do you have internally? So when you said you could spin them up, this, yeah, this so was our biggest challenge yeah. at the time because, you know, Niantic, um, very protective of, of what they do and what they wanna make. At the same time, you have Exola offering such turnkey services. And so that was a, a consideration and, and it continues to be and, and they're slowly letting their guard down and I think really beautifully embracing all of these things that everyone's talking about but it's taken them a long time when I was there to not just you know reskin the offers in the game and just throw them right. into the web store yeah. and really understand how to think about the player uh, Niantic is completely player first but you know sometimes when you're so close to it you miss that and then the other challenge for Niantic was who are all the stakeholders you think about Pokemon Go and that IP, we're a licensee, they are a licensee. You have the Pokemon company, you have, you have Nintendo, so you have mm -hmm. to explain you know, so of. many new things to, to all the stakeholders right. in the process. And so because this was new, because there are cultural challenges, because there are different ways of doing business, mm -hmm. down to who are the you know, payment service you know, providers yes. at that level, not the merchant of record. Well, even the merchant of record side, yeah. you know, explaining, wait, you're handling, letting someone else handle our taxes with all these other people? <laughs> what are you talking Michael about? Michael had the same question. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> That you know, part was a very easy sell in terms of, you know, less taxing to deal with. Yeah, no, yeah. not for us. I'm like, wait, <laughs> yeah. you want why, to do, this? Why yeah. do you want to do this? So for us, it was, it was a very hard sell internally, and, yep. and so I walked away from that, and Sam's still dealing with that. <laughs> yeah. Like, sweet. Um, They're great partners, though. No, like, they and, they and finally I, embraced it. Yeah, right? and yeah. I mean, it was a very big move for them, so I think it was um, fantastic, and you know, they have other titles, they're considering those, and for me, where I sit now, even though I don't do mobile directly, I still feel like I've learned so much from, from those of you who've been in the trenches and from the, the direct-to-consumer stuff that I helped do there. Yeah because I have to educate the future, and I do think the future is, is, is here, and I have to do it a little bit with kid gloves where I am, yeah. but eventually we're gonna evolve beyond just you know, VR, we're gonna be doing mobile, probably tie-ins to a lot of our IP, mm -hmm. and I'd like to be there, and, and these things are very important, and if you talk about stakeholders, I've got Tom Cruise, <laughs> I've yeah. gotta say in this stuff, <laughs> he's not that easy to deal with, no. he's lovely. Great man. Um, great guy. Great guy. Great guy. Great guy. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's very different for a company that you would think, oh, you got one IP, it can't be that hard. It really it's, was hard. It's a culture <laughs> shift. Um, yeah. And you inherited a great business that had built a lot of those services Definitely. and features. Yep. And probably you are leaning in and borrowing a lot of them, I'm, ass Definitely. I'm assuming, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, practices. That's um, Michael. Did you guys have to, was this a big resource like uh, play for you guys? And when you, because I, I remember talking to you guys like three years ago and yeah. it took, and me stalking your <laughs> CEO. And then one day it was just like, something had just turned. Like, yeah. can, do you know like what was, like how, why, or was it just like? Similar to what was said about being the first mover in something, mm -hmm. we're a generally risk averse company. Yeah. Um, our core audience tends to be on the older side, so mm. getting them into something unfamiliar when we've spent years telling them not to click on links from emails because it could be a scam. <laughs> like, you know, it's a, a shift in mentality that yeah. we need to get our users to wrap their heads around. Um, so uh, there was that part of it from an internal kind of mentality standpoint. And then, yeah, from a resource standpoint, we do have some central services that that generate our 
our engine for our games. Um, but anything that we want to do is a, increase, a resource increase, and so we you know have to do the ROI analysis on all of it and make yeah. sure that it all pans out. So. Yeah. And that's the fun part of being part of a I, large company. And I'm gonna, I was going to yeah. to point to you because I, I feel like you have a lot to say on this because you dealt with it when you're yeah. your other company. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, you know, ultimately, I think the easiest way to get adoption or adoption or, or I guess, acclimatize mm -hmm. uh, a company to the idea of pushing something like this forward is to, to generate a proof point. So. Mm -hmm. Show it in a vertical. Um, pick the vertical that is the least contentious, um, hmm. but also the most leaned in. So, like, I think it is. Uh, so for example, um, when I did this, you know, on mobile the first time, uh, you know, I owned the PNL of the game yeah. that I was going to do this against. I borrowed from that PNL, stood up a team, a cheap, very small team. Yeah. Like sixty grand, literally, is how much what? it costs to get this thing <laughs> off the ground. Yeah, it was. It was just me, two other guys I hired that are are now. Yeah, I mean, you know, them. I know who they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they're that cheap. Wow. <laughs> well, no, no, not them. The team that built. Okay, yeah. They, they, they cost our, more than that. That was, that was Armenia. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it was just the three of us, and we knew, you know, it was very controlled, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I had faith in it. And uh, the team um, that was working on that product, uh, I'd convinced them that that was the direction, the strategy that yeah. we wanted to embrace. And I de-risked it by, again, like peeling it out. It was basically like a skunk works project, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, and I set, I set goals for that team, uh, like certain reward structures in place if, if they hit certain achievements. Oh which was also a motivating factor, because I, I believe if you really want the best result, you have to motivate the people executing the work on the day-to-day -day basis, yep. because it is, it is not just a like, right. switch that you yeah. flip and yeah. all of a sudden yeah. things happen. Yeah. It is a, it's, a whole, it's a whole ecosystem play, and you yeah. gotta have everyone who's attached to that game leaning in to deliver the yep. best result. Yeah. But once you get that, you know, and you've got that proof point, in this case, you know, moving literally over half the revenue, I know, um, it was like close to 50%. Yeah, right? yeah. like off, off of the, the platform and onto the new platform. And it you wasn't can't just, ignore that. and it wasn't yeah. like, <laughs> I mean, the other crazy thing, and this actually kind of surprised me personally, but uh, it actually, it, it wasn't that the pie's distribution changed. It was that plus the pie grew. So, so you talk about that. Yeah, so it, it, because, because you're offering a lot more than just like, you know, alternative payment options mm -hmm. for packs yeah. of content. And yeah. because of what I, what I said before, you know, you're building like a value proposition uh, in an experiential way for, for players and you're building other things that they can get um, that are associated to that platform, for instance, like avatars, things like that, that aren't even, they don't even get used in the game, yeah. but they're things that give them identity mm -hmm. um, in that social space. Stuff like that just creates new revenue generating vectors. Um, and so the, the pie, of revenue itself grows as a byproduct of that. And that, I think, the combination of that plus the effectiveness of moving people over and again being able to test these, uh, these new features that then impact like retention yeah. um, and, and kind of like stickiness of, of the player uh, sort of base itself, um, I think that becomes a very easy sell at that point. It's like, <laughs> This was an older title too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. How, this how was like five years old, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And the revenue just kind of plateaued. Yeah, actually, yeah. The, I mean, this was transformational for that product. Absolutely transformational. Wow. Reven, like, the, yeah, they were hitting new revenue peaks, you know, like years after they plateaued and started to decline. Wow. Um, and the the profit, the profitability on that particular uh, game was absolutely transformed. It went from like a you know, 10% margin business to like a 70 or something percent margin business. <laughs> so yeah. That's wild. And yeah. Lewis, like listening to that, is that kind of what you've seen happen at, uh, on some of your titles? Or are you implementing some of that like strategy? Yeah, I mean, I can't kind of comment on that of course, specifically, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think, I think the, the macro point there makes sense, which is, you know, taking a step back and starting by defining what's the value for the player mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that that's something other than a pure commercial offering. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it's a similar 
there's a similar dynamic there. I, what, what I've always said before is like, I think that game developers are like carnivorous sheep, you know, or they're really <laughs> scared of things, but then they all herd together once yeah. there's like blood. So, you know, it's a similar dynamic where, you know, people are very fearful at first of doing anything direct to consumer. Yeah. And then I think once they start to see examples either at the company or within that category at different companies or, ex you know, elsewhere externally, then they start to say like, how can we begin to do the same thing? And then I think, you know, it depends. There's different dispositions for different p l leaders at any company. Yeah. But a lot of the folks are, you know, when you start to take their numbers and project, you know, how much better their numbers could be with yeah. direct to consumer, you know, shares that are that, you know, there's are proof points for, then you know, I think those those folks start to, to lean in and get pretty yeah. excited about yeah. it. Yeah. So and then you know, I think different teams dispositionally will have different focuses at any given time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I it, that that all resonates and you know I um, I think it, it makes a ton of sense. So when you were at Niantic, um, I remember there was a lot of fear of offering what they considered a discount or a value. And um, now, now I feel like that's changed. Um, do you think, you know, moving forward, you know, at, that will set a precedent, not, not at Niantic, but for further you know, other titles, maybe when you start to do the Skydance, like could you like, you know, listening to what they've said, implement that same strategy? Oh, without a doubt. Um, you know, there's always the concern as to am I giving an advantage or disadvantage to people yeah. on the web, giving them something that you can't do in the game. I know that's always a concern. Yeah. You know, um, but but in general, it's it's a smart move. Yeah. To to be doing this, uh, regardless. I mean, uh, just thinking how to resource, thinking about the player journey, thinking about all of those factors is is. Yeah. To be doing that. It's just the question is, you know, what is it that, you know, for us, because our players are not coming from mobile, mm -hmm. you know, coming from a headset, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's a different kind of switching cost. How do you right. get someone, not only do you get someone from yeah. a mobile device where the majority, I mean, you may have an older demographic, you know, people who are addicted to their phones, all of us are, yeah. you know, how do you get them back to, to the web, whether on your phone or on your laptop, but now you get to get someone to take off a headset. Yeah. Right. And so how do you train them? So it's a whole new learning curve. Habitual. Yeah. Right. And what is it? And, and especially in VR, there's not, they're moving towards a lot of in-app purchases, mm -hmm. but right now it's download own. Mm. So there's so many different things yeah. with the community that I'm going to have to think about when yeah. we do have that entry point, that product skew that yeah. might be a mobile complementing. You know, how do I move the whole ecosystem? Around. Around. Yeah, that's true. It's a very different thing. There's enough friction in those headsets. Yeah. So <laughs> speaking of friction, you know, Michael, you guys have a demographic that, as you said, is older. Mm -hmm. um, and when I mean older, like mid 40s, 50s ish. Ish. And how, you mean wiser. Wiser, yes. <laughs> They're watching their money closely. But how are you getting them to break the? That's a big step, in my opinion, because you're training them now to take their credit card out of their phone and enter a new information into a thing that seems very foreign to them. Is it expected value? Is it something that's so unique? Is it a combination of both? Yeah, so um, for some people, we literally handhold them. Um, <laughs> like call them? By call them, yeah. Wow. We, we have existing relationships with a lot of our you know, VIPs that are important to us. So. Yeah. For those people, it's hand-holding. Um, for the, the masses, it's um, just showing them the opportunity, giving them some extra value, and then uh, really the not just making it about the commercial part, but about the extra experience. That they're value, getting out of like, it, yeah. You know. It, we don't want to just make it a store where somebody goes and buys something. We want to give them a reason to go there. Yeah. And Spencer, you talked about this at th that previous company you're at, where you said you exposed that store initially to a very small cohort, mm -hmm. and these were the guys that were spending the most, right? Yeah. Um, and then you were very creative and pushed the envelope on how you got those users to the store. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit, little bit about once that happened, when you made that shift to start exposing the store to more people, mm -hmm. and did you really lean in and push the envelope even further with those other cohorts? Yeah, um, yes. So I think I, you know, measured approach at first, 
segmenting, sort of identifying like a key target audience, effectively testing the waters there also happens to be. I mean, yeah. anyone who, who runs games, be they casual games all the way to, uh, to mid-core, hardcore games, knows that the spend distribution is nonlinear. Yeah. Like the, the smallest portion of spenders spend the most money. Yeah. So like you've got a very clear target for where you get you know, 80% of your total potential mm -hmm. value yeah. out of the gate. Um, and so you, you aim to kind of convert those people first. Um, and then you can move that barrier of, of entry down um, over time as you get more comfortable with it, as you've built more things. Again, because like you don't want to drive, I think, you don't want people to have a bad experience. The whole point of this is, is to create an ecosystem yeah. um, and to make sure that ecosystem is sticky. Yeah. Uh, and so what you don't want to do, because like the people who spend the most are the most motivated to, mm -hmm. to stick around by virtue of the fact that yeah. they're the most invested. What you don't want to do is push a bunch of people um, through a, a funnel of friction if you're not confident that the point you're pushing them to is going to increase the stickiness yes. and engagement. And yeah. so when I think about direct to consumer in general or um, you know the this this whole topic it's not it's not just a it's not a payment thing it's a ecosystem thing it's really mm -hmm. about cross platform yeah it's really about like yeah. how it, how do i occupy it. more time on different devices it's like device agnostic sort of player reach and yeah. engagement um, is kind of the, the thesis mm -hmm. and um, and that's that's where you want to focus so yeah i mean you can start by engaging pe with people you're confident aren't going to attrit, you know, by virtue of a, a small amount of friction. You yep. test, the, test the waters, and it seems somewhat counterintuitive. You might say, well, you know, most, like, valuable players, why would I take the risk on them first? Well, the answer to that is because they are the stickiest. Like, they're, yeah. they've already, they're so engaged, you know? Yeah. So, like, as and long as you've got something. something good, yeah. they're going to go for it. And then you just improve it. And you, you, you uh, effectively improve the funnel and the experience and how intuitive it is and how easy it is to go back and forth. And, like, again, what types of experiences are you having on web that are different than what you're getting in the actual game client itself? How you're interacting with the community? Yeah. I mean, people already do it. Think about this. You know, where do most um, players and guilds and, and kind of... Um, uh, groups of people that are playing games interact yeah. uh, socially. Yeah. And the answer is not in the game usually, it's, it's on Discord yeah. Yeah, exactly. or Reddit yeah. or you know, forums or whatever. Yeah. And so it's the same, same thesis. It's like if, if that engagement layer is present and sticky and it's comprehensive and it brings like added color to the entire experience, then... Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. It works when you vote. Most people have set up these web stores after they have a, 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 a title that's already been out there. Mm -hmm. You can identify that. Would you say that if you had the resources, mm -hmm. sort of what we do in transmedia storytelling and world building, right? You want to tell the right story the right way in the right platform, and you think about all the different channels you can tell that story from the beginning. Yep. Would you say that if you had the resources to do so, would you launch, launch a web store with a new title? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, doing it right now. So yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah like so the, the entire strategy um, is, is right. literally built around this thesis, that, uh, that ecosystem, right? It's like, what are all the, especially You're training them from the beginning case. that they have this yeah. whole ecosystem. Uh, absolutely, Wonderful. absolutely. It's, especially when you have a bunch of touch points like yep. you're talking about. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think, too, if you look at it from the perspective of a game life cycle, then there's also a lot of benefit mm -hmm. to doing it earlier around mm -hmm. You know, building a central site to market the game. You know, thinking about things like pre-registration. Yep, right. how That's to a present big the game That's in the best light. Yeah. So I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of those kind of features. You know, you could use to seed a community early, and then you know the yeah. the web store e-commerce becomes just one of those. Yeah, you know, you're building those habits, and now right. it's natural. Yep. You're not asking them to learn totally. something new or coming after reskinning something. Yep. Yeah, Definitely. no, that yep. makes total sense. Thank you. So I just realized we have a minute left for questions. <laughs> I asked the first one. Yes, the first yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, the mic's right up there. Um, we have about a couple minutes. Yeah. Just come up to the mic. Hi. Uh, I guess I should say my name. Alex St. Louis, uh, co-founder of Wonder Interactive. I'm curious. Uh, you guys are doing uh, awesome stuff around web store experiences. Uh, uh, at Exola, are you thinking about how to get players not to just uh, pay on the web, but play on the web in terms of in-browser games or cloud gaming? And like, what do you see as the future of that, in your opinion? Thanks. So uh, 
cloud gaming is a, is a big piece of it. Uh, we think that's another way of distributing your game without um, in, violating any sort of guidelines because once you get that player in the cloud experience, you can start offering them um, uh, different types of virtual items, virtual uh, uh, packages, stuff like that. We actually have our own solution, so thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> um, I think, you know, and I know you've been interested in cloud as well because we talked to you about it a couple times. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I'd say on the whole, though, like, yes, we, we have a number of games that users can play on the web today. You know, as I was mentioning, you can play, you know, Zynga Poker on the web for years, and I think that it makes sense just to make playing as accessible as possible across any touch point or channel. Um, in terms of cloud, I think one of the nice things that it does is it just, in, in the mobile context, it means that you can play a game on the web with you know, less porting cost and less work mm -hmm. um, than it would be to get the game to run at, you know, like a WebGL you know, a version of a, a Unity game, uh, for example. But I think, um, you know, I haven't really seen that done like, too successfully yet, uh, too broadly. Um, but I do think that you know, the, the whole idea of making it as easy as possible to play the game wherever you are makes a ton of sense. Cool. Anyone else? One more question? <laughs> well, I think that's it then for Great. today. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Jenna. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.